On September 12, 2019, the third Democratic primary debate for the 2020 presidential election took place on ABC. And as is common practice during such an occasion, a lot of questions were not given simple straight answers, if they were even answered at all. Let's have a look at a few of them, starting simple with the very first question, which was asked of former Vice President Joe Biden. Both Senators Warren and Sanders want to replace Obamacare with Medicare for all. You want to build an Obamacare, not scrap it. They propose spending far more than you to combat climate change and tackle student loan debt, and they would raise more in taxes than you to pay for their programs. Are Senators Warren and Sanders pushing too far beyond where Democrats want to go and where the country needs to go? There's the question. Basically, Biden is being asked for his political opinion of policies which are more progressive than his. That'll be for the voters to decide that question. This was a fairly innocent dodge. What Biden implied with this answer is that it doesn't really matter what his opinion is. He stands where he stands, the other candidates stand where they stand, and whoever gets the most votes is the nominee. Who cares where he thinks the party needs to go? So it's an excusable sidestepping of the question, but a sidestepping nonetheless. Will middle class taxes go up to pay for the program? I know you believe that the deductibles and the premiums will go down. Will middle class taxes go up? Will private insurance be eliminated? Here, Senator Elizabeth Warren was asked if taxes would increase for those in the middle class to pay for her health care proposal. Fundamentally, this is a yes or no question. Not to say that she can't elaborate, but listen for the initial yes or no. Will middle class taxes go up? Will private insurance be eliminated? Look, what families have to deal with is cost, total cost. Something very simple yet easy to miss just happened. The question was rephrased in a couple of ways. First, the middle class was substituted with families. Second, the term taxes was substituted with the term costs. So in the end, Senator Warren never actually says whether taxes will go up for the middle class, but rather that costs will go down for families. Costs are going to go up for wealthier individuals and costs are going to go up for giant corporations, but for hard work Working families across this country, costs are going to go down, and that's how it should work. Flashback. If you feel stuck in the middle of the extremes in our politics and you are tired of the noise and the nonsense, you've got a home with me. End of flashback. Senator Klobuchar, you said in your opening statement you, don't, you want to represent the people stuck in the middle of the extremes. Who represents the extreme on this stage? This is a very simple question, and much like the first question to Joe Biden, Amy Klobuchar is not being asked for her policies, but for her political opinion. Fair enough, she did claim to represent those between the extremes, so somebody on this stage must represent one of those extremes. The question is, who? I think you know that I don't agree with some of these proposals up here, George. So I'm talking Which about ones? if I could if I could respond to some of the proposals but from my friends. In recent days, former Vice President Biden has said about executive orders, some really talented people are seeking the nomination. They said, I'm going to issue an executive order. Biden saying there's no constitutional authority to issue that executive order when they say I'm going to eliminate assault weapons, saying you can't do it by executive order any more than Trump can do things when he says he can do it by executive order. Does the vice president have a point there? Now here, Kamala Harris was asked to counter an argument made by Vice President Biden. Harris has proposed banning a type of weapon by issuing an executive order should she be president. But Biden has argued that that's unconstitutional. It's legally impossible. Does the vice president have a point there? A few things happened during Harris's answer. First, she invokes Barack Obama's 2008 campaign slogan. Second, she states that she has seen a lot of homicide victims. Third, she mentions that Congress hasn't yet acted on this issue. Fourth, she mentions that children go through drills at schools. Fifth, she compliments Beto O'Rourke. And lastly, she criticizes Donald Trump. But she never quite counters Joe Biden's argument. Oh, I mean, I would just say, hey, Joe. Instead of saying, no, we can't, let's say, yes, we can. <laughs> let's be constitutional. We got a constitution. And yes, we can, because I'll tell you something. The way that I think about this is um, I've seen more autopsy photographs than I care to tell you. 
I have attended more police officer funerals than I care to tell you. I have hugged more mothers of homicide victims than I care to tell you. And the idea that we would wait for this Congress, which has just done nothing, to act is just, it, it, is, it is overlooking the fact that every day in America, our babies are going to school to have drills, elementary, middle, and high school students. It is traumatizing our children. El Paso, and Beto, God love you for standing so courageously in the midst of that tragedy. You know, people asked me in El Paso, they said, you know, because I have a long-standing record on this issue, they said, well, do you think Trump um, is responsible for what happened? And I said, well, look, I mean, obviously he didn't pull the trigger, but he's certainly been tweeting out the ammunition. People may not vote for me. <laughs> no, and I agree with that. One of the things that Harris included in her answer was an anecdote, a short, interesting, or amusing story related to a particular topic. When Senator Harris mentioned the eight-year-old boy she spoke to or the mothers of homicide victims that she's hugged, those were examples of anecdotes. And that was part of the answer given by Cory Booker when he was asked this question. You have argued if you need a license to drive a car in this country, you should have a license to buy a gun. Gun owners would not only have to pass a background check, they would have to obtain a federal license to buy a gun. This would require, as you know, Congress to pass legislation. If Democrats can't get universal background checks, how would you get this done? And can you name one Republican colleague of yours in the Senate right now who would be on board with this idea? Now, this is a question that practically no Democrat would want to answer. The question essentially goes, well, if your party failed last time, how do we know you're not going to fall flat on your face next time? So, how does Cory Booker answer this question? He tells an anecdote about the time he moved to Newark, New Jersey, 20 years ago. This is the issue. Look, I grew up in the suburbs. It was about 20 years ago that I came out of my home when I moved to inner city Newark, New Jersey and witnessed the aftermath of a shooting. Already, this sounds like a dodge. However, during his answer, Senator Booker does address the question that he was asked. You want to know how we get this done? We get this done by having a more courageous empathy where people don't wait for this hell to visit upon their communities. We must awaken a more courageous empathy in this country so that we stand together and fight together. Again, the question basically asked, how are Democrats going to succeed at something that they failed at last time? A more courageous empathy, stand together, fight together, doesn't answer that question, obviously. So the question was asked a second time. And the second answer was what you might call word salad. A quick follow-up, though, because Americans watching tonight know the reality of Congress in Washington. I asked, do you have a Republican colleague in the Senate who would be on board with this idea to get this done? You know, if, if that was the attitude when Strom Thurmond had the longest filibuster ever on civil rights, if it was this idea that we can't get it done because of the situation in the Senate, I'm looking to lead a movement the number one reason why governments are formed is to protect the citizenry. Sometimes when a candidate sidesteps a question, they do it using a lot of words, much like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker. But sometimes they don't use very many words at all. Um, in an interview eight months ago, you were asked what to do with the so-called overstayers, people who come with a visa and then stay. And you said, I don't know. Uh, do you have an answer now? To Beto O'Rourke's credit, he addresses the question, but then quickly ditches it using a very simple technique. He simply posits a different question himself. See if you can catch the moment when that happens. Do you have an answer now? I do, and, and if you read the rest of that article in the Washington Post, I talked about harmonizing our entry-exit system with Mexico in the same way that we do with Canada. I think that could help us to keep a handle on visa overstays, but I think the larger question... <laughs> 
that we're trying to get at is how do we rewrite this country's immigration laws in our own image. Then, once he's put forward a more general question, he flatters the city that he's currently in. In the image of Houston, Texas, the most diverse city in the United States of America. So, as we've observed, avoiding a question is a very simple matter of either rephrasing the question by replacing certain terms, speaking for a very long time until the initial question is likely forgotten, or offering random praise to pacify the audience and the viewers at home. With all of this in mind, let's observe one more question. In a conversation about how to deal with segregation in schools back in 1975, you told a reporter, I don't feel responsible for the sins of my father and grandfather. I feel responsible for what the situation is today, for the sins of my own generation. And I'll be damned if I feel responsible to pay for what happened 300 years ago. You said that some 40 years ago. But as you stand here tonight, what responsibility do you think that Americans need to take to repair the legacy of slavery in our country? The following answer darts in many different directions. So to keep up with where it goes, we'll just pause briefly each time the answer changes direction. Well, they have to deal with the, the look. OK, OK, bumpy start. Now the answer begins. There is institutional segregation in this country. And from the time I got involved, I started dealing with that. Still not quite addressing the question, Biden gives a few examples. Redlining, banks, making sure that we are in a position where, look, we talk about education. And he just changed the subject to education, particularly regarding poor people, which is kind of problematic given what he was asked. He never does address the subject of the question or his past remarks. Triple the amount of money we spend from 15 to 45 billion a year. Make sure that we bring in to the help the, the, student, the, the teachers deal with the problems that come from home. Make sure that every single child does in fact have three, four and five year olds go to school. School, not daycare, school. Play the radio, make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night, the, the, the phone, make sure the kids hear words. We should be allowing people to come here from Venezuela. I know Maduro. I'm the guy that came up with $740 million to see to it those three countries, in fact, change their system so people don't have a chance to leave. You're all acting like we just discovered this yesterday. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You Vice much. President. Hopefully, you've gained a bit more perspective on how and why presidential debates often produce very satisfying statements that often dance around the initial question that was asked. Thanks for watching this video today. Thanks to Te Texas Southern University for hosting us tonight. It was a great crowd. Thank you. As well, thanks to you. Thanks to everyone.